major events. I, I wanted to read a, a quote as we uh, get it before we get into the text from uh, Donald uh, Sanukian, Sinu who is kind of the uh, the teacher of preachers, uh, uh, one of the really good ones around these days. And this is from a sermon called The Last Enemy. And of course, The Last Enemy is Death. And kind of an appropriate Easter quote here. But to try to uh, bring some reality to us because, uh, because of the way that we study uh, the text itself, it's very, in a sense, analytical. You know, it's, uh, it's real. This is what it says. This is what it means. Here's the information. And Revelation, by its very nature, requires a, a lot of explanation. We don't necessarily just read through the book and kind of get everything. You know, it's, uh, we need to know background things and, and so forth. Uh, even as we'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of the theological implications of the millennial kingdom here in just a moment. But I, I thought this quote, I read it this week, I thought it was uh, good because uh, as we study the millennial kingdom, uh, it should bring a joy and a blessing to our hearts because we're going to be part of it. And we're going to be part of it because Jesus Christ conquered death and paid the price for our sins. That's why we're going to be there. And that's the ultimate thing I think we want to remember. But anyway, I thought this was interesting. Uh, he says, uh, quote, death is your enemy, an enemy that is coming after you. It takes you a while to realize this. For the first 20 or 30 years of your life, you never think about it. Uh, every year you get stronger and stronger and smarter and smarter. You get better looking, more beautiful, more handsome. You get more competent in your job. The fullness of life is ahead of you. Death is an unreal concept. You won't admit it. How many of you in your 20s and 30s thought that? And, don't raise your hand if you're in your 20s and 30s now, but uh, uh, it, really is, it really is true. You can tell by the behavior of some people. Death is an unreal concept. There's not a real fear of it. He goes on, he says, uh, you never think about it, but somehow in your mid-30s, you get a little hint that death is your enemy, that death is after you. The realization that death is coming it might come about because of something as simple as playing shortstop in a softball game. There's a grounder over second base. Don't laugh too hard, Kevin. Uh, you, we've all been there. You dig the cleats into the ground, lower your body, move towards second base with your gloves stretched out. You're going to grab the ball, pivot, throw the runner out at first. But to your utter amazement, the ball goes three inches past your glove into center field. What? How did that happen? I always get those grounders over second. How did I miss that one? Ah, your mind wrote a check your body couldn't cash. <laughs> Great line. <laughs> you slowed a step. Or maybe a hint comes when you look in the mirror and see the lines in your face, the gray in your hair, so the waddles in your, in your neck or the ridges on your elbows. Or maybe it sinks in when you watch your parents die. When they're no more part of your world, you suddenly begin to realize your time will come too. Perhaps this sense of death uh, coming uh, after you hits you most strongly when someone your own age gets sick and dies. Someone you grew up with, someone you went to school with, someone who was in your wedding, someone who raised their kids the same way you did. At some point, for various reasons, a troubling thought begins to nag at the corners of your mind. I'm going to die too. I only have so many years left, and then I will be no more. I don't know where you're, where you're at, in the, if you're in denial, <laughs> if, or if it comes uh, to your mind. But the point is, there's a lot of people, and maybe even us at times, that have those thoughts, that wonder about those things, but Jesus Christ has conquered death, and we will be with him in the millennial kingdom. And so as we study this, yeah, it's a little analytical. Yeah, I'm going to go through some the a little systematic theology here uh, in the, the rest of my introduction, but this passage is meant to bring real joy to our hearts, and uh, I'm going to give you a chance to express that joy when we get to the end here. You're all wondering, wow, I wonder what that's going to be like. Millennial, it, uh, two Latin words uh, that simply means thousand and a year. A thousand year reign of Jesus Christ mentioned six times uh, in this, this passage we're going to look at this morning. Uh, it's a time when the church is ruling and reigning with Christ and all of the promises to the nation of Israel are fulfilled. And as we've been <coughs> going through Isaiah and we get to them, we've been through some of the other other prophets in the past, every promise to Israel, including the son of David, Jesus, the Messiah, literally sitting on a literal throne in Jerusalem, ruling and reigning, all of those promises will, will be fulfilled. And we'll read a few of those again 
uh, as we close. There's three, three views that, uh, that Christians take uh, of the millennial kingdom. One is known as a millennial. You put an A in front of something, it means it ain't going to happen. A millennial. No millennial reign. This is the view of the Roman Catholic Church, most of the Reformed churches, Lutheran, Presbyterian, and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, they don't think there will literally be. They think this is uh, just a metaphor for, for something else. Uh, they derive their theology from one person. That is uh, Augustine in his book, The City of God, uh, just a symbolic time. Uh, and, of course, they believe that believers right now, in a sense, uh, in heaven, are living in the millennial kingdom, this time of, of uh, Christ's rule and everything. Uh, and they say that uh, that rule extends to the, to the earth. Uh, and, of course, it's been said by uh, more than one person that, <clears throat> well, then if Satan is chained, he's got a very long chain uh, because uh, he sure seems to still be uh, active uh, in the world. But that's... That's the view of the reformers and, and Roman Catholicism, all millennial, millennialism. And if you want to be Pentecostal, just say that real fast about five times, and that'll kind of help you get going. Don't do it right now, though. Uh, view two uh, is postmillennial. Uh, and again, that believes that uh, uh, the return of Jesus Christ comes, comes after the millennial. Now, there's, there's a, there's a thousand-year reign of the church so after the church goes out, preaches the gospel to the whole world, uh, not everybody, but most people get saved, become Christians. We take over in terms of the ruling and reigning and political positions, positions of, uh, of sovereignty of nations and so forth. Uh, and after we establish God's kingdom here, then Jesus comes back. Post-millennialism, very popular in the 1800s because uh, uh, Britain was sending out missions missionaries all over the world. Uh, America got on board, sends out Adoram Judson, uh, and, uh, and uh, we have Bible uh, translators going out. The word is getting translated. People are getting saved all over the world. People are becoming Christians, and so they hold this view. We are establishing God's kingdom uh, even now. Ran into a little snag called World War I. You know, this whole idea of Bringing in God's kingdom and peace wasn't, wasn't really going real well there in Europe when they were fighting it out. Uh, that was followed by World War II. And by the time that was over, not too many people held this view any longer. But it's, it's actually come back around now. Uh, and there's a few people that uh, hold this view. Uh, and they are called kingdom now theologians or dominionist theologians. Uh, and they believe, again, that, and you'll hear it in their language and they're teaching their sermons and their books uh, occasionally. We talk about God's kingdom coming to a person's heart. We bow our knee to the lordship of Jesus Christ. We enter his kingdom and so forth. Uh, so it's it, just because a person says kingdom doesn't mean they hold this theological position. But if you listen a little longer, uh, if it has to do with how we're going to take over, uh, it's because they hold this position that we are going to take over and establish the kingdom of God. And then Jesus comes back. Uh, the third view, which is the correct view, is uh, pre-millennialism. And you get that by reading the Bible. If you just read the Bible, that's what it says, basically. To hold the other view, you have to say, it says this, but I think it means something else. Uh, but if you just read the Bible, uh, as we're, we're going to hear in a moment, uh, we'll see that Jesus Christ comes back to planet Earth is uh, we saw in chapter 19, and then he establishes his, his reign on this earth. And some very interesting things take place during that time period. Look at the first one, and that is Satan will be restrained, but notice it's only for a time, and that's in verse 1 to 3. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after this, he must be released for a little while. So Satan is uh, restrained by an angel. And notice it's an unnamed angel. We've, we've, we've met some angels in this book. The, you know, the, the worship guys, you know, that rock band that's in front of the, the throne of God that we looked at, we could tell the kind of music they play by their description and so forth. We're going, 
I think I missed that sermon. But uh, anyway, there, there, the cherubim, some mighty and powerful angels. I just think it's interesting that the angel that comes to, uh, to bind Satan and put him in the bottomless pit is like, uh, you do it. It's like, Mr. Generic Angel, can you take care of this? Uh, and I think it puts into perspective who Satan is in terms of a fallen angel. Sometimes uh, we get this idea because of his attacks against us, what he's done to people in the world, how he deceives entire political systems uh, uh, as, we, as we've seen uh, in our studies. Uh, we get it out of context of who he is compared to God. And the final analysis when it's time for him to be bound, it's just like, yeah, any of you guys, just go take care of that. Take a really good chain with you when you, when you go. It's not a, he's not even named, uh, this, uh, this angel here. But he's restrained, as I said, because he controls political systems. Notice what he's referred to as the great fiery red dragon, which is a reference back to chapter 12, verse 3, where Satan is cast out of heaven. Now he's cast out of earth, in a sense. And when he was cast out of heaven, what did he do? That's when we have the rise of the Antichrist, his rule, his reign, Satan empowering him, and he, through the Antichrist, or the beast, taking over the political systems of, of the world. And that's, that's true today. And uh, uh, we can study them, we can look at them, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's going to get worse in the future. Notice also he accuses believers, and again, back in chapter 12, verse uh, 10, he is the accuser of the brethren who accuse them before God uh, day and night. So he, he is restrained at this point. Secondly, he is restrained in the bottomless pit. He's not thrown into to, to hell. He's actually thrown in the bottomless pit uh, that uh, is referenced a few other times in our, in our book. Uh, and so he is held in a temporary place because God has one more task for him to perform. Uh, and that is he's going to free him uh, at the end of the millennial kingdom. Now, how many think that's a bad idea? I, I think that's a bad idea. So we'll take a vote, write it down, shoot it up to heaven when we're done. Let God know what we think of, of that particular idea. But we'll look at some, maybe some of the reasons why God does that. So the angel does four things. He binds him with a chain for a thousand years. He cast him into the bottomless pit. He shuts him up and he puts a seal over him. Uh, now, it's not the first time we've heard of this particular place. 2 Peter uh, 2 4 says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, but that's our same place, the bottomless pit or the abyss, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be preserved for judgment. They're there, preserved, held for judgment in the, uh, in the future. Jude 6 says the same things, that the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their habita habitation are reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So there is a place called the bottomless pit or the abyss where, where fallen angels are held waiting for a place of judgment in the future, and that's where Satan will be during the millennial kingdom, which will make things rather nice. Uh, does he bother you? See, he bothers me all the time. So I, I think this is going to be a wonderful thing. Satan is restrained, again, from deceiving the nations, the third thing. And uh, Paul uh, uh, used similar language to his deceptive activities in, uh, in 2 Corinthians. And, uh, and Zechariah, in, in uh, chapter 14, verse 16, makes it clear that there are nations during the millennial reign. The armies of the nations are destroyed. We saw that last week. But those nations exist uh, people from those nations are judged during that 75-day period, uh, but they are around during the millennial kingdom. Zechariah says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast uh, of tabernacles. Again, we, <coughs> the temple is rebuilt. Uh, those uh, feasts are re reestablished. And the... Uh, Old Testament prophets speak a lot about the fact of the activities of the millennial reign of Christ, the things that will be going on. Uh, but there's people here. There's people that survive the, the tribulation. A lot, most are killed during that time period. But there are those that survive. And uh, those that survive will repopulate uh, the earth. And part of what they'll do is they'll be going to Jerusalem to keep the feast uh, and to pay homage and worship to Jesus. Now, 
we're going to see in the end that it's one thing to give lip service to God. It's another thing to mean it from, from your heart because many, many, many of these people will be deceived by Satan still once again. So Satan's bound. The Lord is worshipped. Jesus is ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. What would that be like? Well, Isaiah tells us a little bit in Isaiah 2, 2. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains there in Jerusalem, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He, Messiah, Jesus, will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruny hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So uh, again, this is a familiar passage maybe that uh, you may not be aware, but uh, inscribed on the front, uh, out front of the United Nations. And um, the idea that that uh, they believe that through man's efforts and so forth, we could bring peace to the world. That peace will only come when Jesus Christ rules and reigns. No wars. And if you notice, there's a few of those going on. And uh, there's always been some somewhere on this planet uh, ever since uh, the, the fall of man. But during the reign of Christ on earth, no wars, no natural disasters. I'm pretty sure summer will be like summer and fall will be like fall and uh, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, farmers will have abundant crops. People will prosper and so forth. And everybody will go and, and realize that Jesus is the king. He's the Lord and pay some homage and, uh, and worship to him. Uh, it'll be uh, an incredible time. Uh, and then, of course, Jesus will sit as the judge of the earth. Isaiah eleven three says, His delight is in the fear of the Lord, Jesus, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness the belt of his waist. Jesus will be the judge and when somebody does something they should not have done, hurt or harmed somebody else in some way, they're going to have to stand before Jesus. And of course, their defense attorney will say, no, they actually won't have any. But they'll begin to say, no, but they actually won't say anything because Jesus will know exactly and that won't depend on his judgment is not dependent upon what somebody saw or what somebody heard. I watched a little bit of one of those cop shows last night. It's, you know, they pull up and there's something going on, some kind of disturbance, and he kind of separates everybody. You know, what's your story? You know, what's your story? And he's trying to ascertain really what's going on. Did they steal it or did they steal it? Did he really buy it or not buy it? You know, try to, these people's stories line up and he's keeping them separated and he's trying not to say anything and let them tell their story because he doesn't want to bait them at all and really hear what they have to say. Uh, these guys are uh, uh, trained uh, incredibly at, at what they do, but it won't be that like that with Jesus. Uh, he'll, he'll, he'll just know. <laughs> he'll know exactly why somebody did something and even what was in their heart, what they were even thinking about it at the moment they did it. He will judge righteously. Uh, it'll be an incredible time. Uh, notice the animal life will be very different as well. And I mentioned this. It goes on in verse 6 of that passage. The wolf also shall, will dwell with the, with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Notice they're no, no longer carnivorous. Uh, the young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like, an, like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So animal life will be different. Is it cool that there's animals during the millennial kingdom? See, if you're an animal lover, this is all very cool. Uh, and uh, yeah. I wonder if they'll talk. You know, but anyway, our relationship with them will, will be very, very different. I did think of a little side note. Uh, without the storms, I don't know if we're going to have any surf. So that, that is a little bit of a concern. But 
because it takes those storms and generates some waves. So uh, maybe we can uh, work on that. But uh, what we do see here, though, is that Satan is released for a short time uh, at the end of that. And we'll get more to that in verse 7. Let's go on. The saints will reign with Christ. Satan is bound for a period of time, and the saints will reign. Verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So uh, there's several groups of people here during the millennial kingdom. These are the, uh, the church age uh, believers will reign. These are the ones who sat on the thrones. We were introduced to them back in chapter 4. So uh, the elders that sat on these thrones were representative of church age believers. Um, and so that means, and of course, uh, we have other references to the fact that we will, the Bible says, rule and reign with, with Christ. So we're part of this kingdom administrators or whatever. I know I've heard Pastor Chuck say many times he's already put his request in. He wants to rule and reign over the North Shore of Oahu. Now, I don't, I don't know if you can do that or not, but he's tried to put in a, an advance reservation. But nonetheless, we'll rule and reign with him. Jesus said this in Matthew 19, 28. So Jesus said to them, As surely I say to you, to the 12 uh, apostles, that in the regeneration when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory... You who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of, of Israel. So uh, if, you, if you looked at a flow chart of the administration of, uh, of justice and, uh, and authority during the millennial kingdom, and, and, and people have, have actually put those together, part of that is you've got the Messiah and you've got the apostles ruling over the 12 tribes of, uh, of Israel. But we're in this thing too, 1 Corinthians 6.2. Do you not know that the saints, you may not feel like it, but we are the saints, those that have been set apart by God, will judge the world. And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Now, Paul's point is that if in the future we're going to rule and reign with Christ, we're going to judge, we're even going to judge the fallen angels Apparently, that's going to be one of the, one of the things that we're uh, involved in, that he says, how much more in this life should you have discernment and be able to judge things correctly, but will rule and reign? And that includes judging the angels. Uh, the other group of people that's here are the martyred saints. Uh, we, it says, uh, then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. Uh, and again, that's uh, a, a consistency and I don't know, we don't know really why the Antichrist would choose that method in the future, but every uh, man, woman, and child during that tribulation period, that seven-year period that puts their faith in Jesus uh, and confesses him will, will be martyred for their faith, and that is the way that they will be martyred. Uh, they had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received his mark on their forehead or on their hands. So they will be rewarded and we see their souls crying out from heaven earlier in a very special place near the throne of God. And so you have church age believers, which is uh, all of us, uh, everybody that's come to faith in Christ from the time of the apostles to, uh, to the time of the rapture are church age believers. And you have the tribulation saints that are part of this kingdom as well. Now, the third thing is it goes on and begins to talk about the resurrection, that some will share in the resurrection. That means, of course, some will not, verses 5 and 6. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So th those that don't know the Lord are not resurrected. They just stay um, uh, in, the, in the ground, in a sense, in Hades, in a place of torment, but a temporary place of torment until the thousand years is over. This is the first resurrection uh, 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 for us, the tribulation saints, Old Testament believers. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So uh, the saints will share in the first resurrection. Church age believers uh, were raptured. Paul says uh, that uh, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud voice with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
After that, we who are left and alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we'll be with the Lord forever. And then he says, therefore, encourage each other uh, with these words. That's, in, that's meant to be encouraging. And uh, uh, so we're, we are already with, with the Lord, church-age believers. Uh, we don't experience the second resurrection, which is when unbelievers are raised at the end of the thousand years. They're going to stand before the white throne judgment. We'll look at that next week. But also at this time, we're already with the Lord. We return with the Lord. Old Testament believers along with tribulation martyrs, are, are resurrected at the end of the tribulation as well. And Daniel, uh, Daniel speaks about this. He says in Daniel 12, 2, uh, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Everybody has eternal life. It's just a matter of where you spend it. You know, sometimes we say, you know, come to faith in Jesus Christ, you'll have e eternal life. Everybody's got eternal life. It's just a matter of where, where you'll spend it. Daniel says some are going to be raised to everlasting life. Others are going to be raised to, uh, to uh, shame and contempt, everlasting contempt. Verse 3, those who are wise, those are the ones that place their faith in the Messiah, will shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So at the millennial kingdom, as it begins, the Old Testament saints, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joseph, you know, Hosea, Ezekiel, Daniel, you know, they're all going to be there. They're all going to be, uh, be resurrected. We'll be able to hang out, talk story a little bit. So Joseph, what was that like being in that pit that long? I mean, come on, what were you really thinking then? You know, we'll be able to, you know, Moses, what was that like crossing the Red Sea and the water standing up? Was that like being at Waimea Bay on a big day? I mean, what was that? Of course, they might be booked. There'd probably be a lot of people, so you can always catch them in eternity if you can't work it in in that first uh, thousand years. But they're, they're going to be resurrected at that point uh, as well. But again, but others, a thousand years apart, the two resurrections, one to everlasting life, one to everlasting shame. Uh, those are the bookends of the millennial kingdom. And of course, a special mention here, as we said, of the tribulation saints. Now, Jesus said, very importantly, in John eleven twenty five, 25, when he comes to, ends up raising Lazarus from the dead, he says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? We have to place our, our faith, not just our theological agreement or a, a mental assent, but we have to take what we believe and combine it with trust. And then we are saved by the, by the grace of God. It's kind of like the, uh, we had a couple of guys in the church, uh, brothers, both, uh, both in the army for a while. <clears throat> and one of their, their grandfather was a guy named uh, the Great Blondin. And the Great Blondin was one of these guys back at the turn of the century that do all the high wire stuff all over and sit on flagpoles and all that stuff. I'm not sure if they called it extreme sports back then, but it was very extreme. Uh, one of his great feats was to um, put a, a wire across Niagara Falls, go across the falls, pushing a wheelbarrow, went across, came back. And, uh, and when he got back to the other side, crowds are all there cheering and so forth. And he said, how many of you believe that I can do that again? Oh, we all believe you can do that again. All right, who would like to get in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> That's what it is to be saved. You get in the wheelbarrow, right? You don't just say, yeah, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and rose again. You actually get in the wheelbarrow and say, and I'm willing to follow you, give my life to you. When we combine trust with belief, that's, that's how we are saved. Let's go on. Secondly, is, uh, there are those who will not share in the first uh, resurrection. As I mentioned, uh, they will be uh, raised at the end. And here we have the, uh, the six, uh, seven Beatitudes in the book. Blessed are you if, and it's blessed are you if you share in the first uh, resurrection. So those who survive the, the tribulation repopulate the earth. Uh, you've got uh, us, church-age believers, ruling and reigning this time period. You've got the Old Testament saints that are there with us. And then you've got the tribulation saints who paid the ultimate price during the tribulation period. Now, Paul says this about the rule and reign of Christ and the resurrection. 
1 Corinthians 15, classic chapter on resurrection. He says, but, uh, but now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by men came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. I'm going to talk about that word in a moment. Christ the first fruits after those who are Christ at his coming. Each in his own order. It's a military term, uh, and it's a, it's a word that was used when the military would go into a formation or into battle. It wasn't random. <laughs> it, it's, everything has a sequence, and everything has an order, is, is, uh, is the idea. And, uh, and so, in terms of the resurrection, Paul says it's Christ, he rises from the dead first as the first fruits, as the example, and then there's a sequence of events for everybody else. Church age believers, then we're in heaven during the tribulation, we come back with Christ, and then the Old Testament saints are raised, tribulation saints are raised, and we're all part of the millennial, millennial kingdom. The fourth thing here, verses 7 to 10, is that at the end, then there's a satanic rebellion. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, Jerusalem, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So Satan has been bound for a thousand years in the abyss, the bottomless pit. Uh, it's a temporary place of abode. And again, how many things is a very ad, bad idea to let that character out of there once again? Is there, you know, and so uh, we're, we're going to kind of let God know might want to think this thing through a little bit more. But it could be, it could be that God was thinking this. Uh, the fact that uh, Satan is a deceiver, uh, even the fact that he's been in prison for a thousand years, at that point he's been unable to affect uh, anyone. But now God allows this one last effort. And uh, in doing so, God would be demonstrating that under the best conditions, man's problems is man's heart. Uh, in other words, people are living for a thousand years, very long lives, very prosperous, no sickness, no disease, no, quote, natural disasters. Uh, all this is going on. It doesn't take a lot of faith to believe in Jesus. You go to Jerusalem once a year. Do you believe in Jesus? Pretty sure it's that guy right there. You know, it's, it's, it's right there. You know, so um, the amount of faith is, is minimal. Uh, and obviously, you realize he will teach the world his ways. People are learning about God. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some great Bible studies going on during that time period and everything. And it's ideal. And still, at the end, Satan is set free. And it doesn't seem like he's set free very long. And how many people are deceived? Like the sea on the sand shore. I'm pretty sure that's a lot. Uh, so it's, 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 just, uh, it's kind of staggering what's, what goes on. This goes slap in the face of what we call liberalism or liberal theology, which says that if man, who is basically neutral, deny of the sin nature, who is basically neutral, is put in the right environment, if he's given the right education and the right opportunities, if, if countries are given the right, the right opportunities to get along with one another, they see all the advantages of that and so forth, then man can get along. We can bring peace to this world. People can be different and so forth because we've given them all the social advantages that they need. And, and what are they? Wonderful things to end racism, you know, to give everybody a good education, the medical care that they need and so forth. These are outstanding things. <clears throat> and this is what... Uh, uh, the liberal part of Christianity lives for is to provide social services for people and God bless them for, for doing it. The problem is it won't ever bring the utopia. It won't ever bring really peace to man's heart because man's heart is basically, as Jeremiah said, my heart is deceitfully wicked and I can't even know it. 
That was a pretty good guy, too, a prophet of God. Lived what we consider a pretty holy life. But that was his description of his own heart. And, um, and so God here allows us to see and the world to see that uh, it's not just a perfect environment. Uh, we need the grace of God. That's the only thing that will change the heart of man. Warren Worsby says this, For many centuries man has dreamed of a golden age, a utopia in which the human race would be free from war, sickness, and even death. Men have tried to achieve this goal on their own and have failed. It is only when Jesus Christ reigns on David's throne that the kingdom will come and the earth will be delivered from the oppression of Satan and sin. It's the final proof the man's heart is desperately wicked. Uh, that, that's one of the possibilities. The other one is, again, that God is demonstrating that Satan's depravity cannot be cured. I mean, you know, the guy's in the bottomless pit. I don't think it's a Club Med or Marriott, you know, for a thousand years. And at the end, he's released, and he's not repenting all over the place. Did you notice that? Man, was I ever wrong. Oh, I repent, Lord, I worship you, and just give, cry out for mercy. You don't get the crying out for mercy thing. He goes right back. When God judges and throws this character uh, into a fire that burns forever and ever, nobody's going to be shedding any tears over it because everybody will understand how absolutely corrupt he is. And he's the one that is our enemy. And uh, we need to keep that, that in mind. And that's why we need to put on the full armor of God and, and leave it on. The third thing is the other possibility behind the, this final rebellion is to demonstrate God's justification for exacting eternal punishment. Notice the nations, plural, that are deceived and, and, uh, and how many there are. Uh, and again, indicating the, the problem with man is the depravity of his, of his own heart. So when in the end, when God judges, he will judge justly, and everybody would say, right on, amen. That absolutely was the right thing to do. Uh, the other thing uh, about this rebellion, it, we have the mention of Gog and Magog coming together in this battle. And certainly, for Bible prophecy students, these are two buzzwords, because as we mentioned uh, uh, off and on, I think a little bit last week, Gog and, and Magog uh, are referenced in Ezekiel. We actually refer to the Magog invasion. Gog is, is, uh, is not uh, a person's name. It's not Gog Smith or Gog Jones. It's like Gog is a title, like Pharaoh, like president, like prime minister. He's a ruler. So uh, in a point in time in the future, a ruler of Magog, which is the southern republics, very specifically the southern republics uh, of uh, the former USSR. It's Russia. And, uh, and when this ruler gathers them together with Persia, Iran, and they make a move against Israel, and we talked about this, God will uh, wipe them out and, and destroy them. Uh, soon to be seen on your local evening news, it appears. Uh, so that, that is a prophetic event that could happen soon in our lifetime. The rapture could come first, and then it happens. Either way, it seems to happen prior to the tribulation. So why are those two characters or those two words mentioned here? It's because in the final rebellion of, of Satan, you have a couple of similar things, but there are some differences, so they're different events. Uh, in the Ezekiel passage, it's an invasion from the north. In this invasion, it's from the four corners of, of the world. Uh, they've literally already been destroyed, but you still have, at least in type, a historical type, a leader, Gog, Satan in this case, uh, Magog, a mixture of nations that he gathers around them and they come against uh, the nation uh, of Israel. So uh, very, very interesting that both of these things are, are brought up once again. And uh, evidently there's a population explosion during the millennial kingdom because we see in the rebellion, those are as the sand of the sea, which means they cannot even be counted. So again, a perfect environment can never produce a perfect heart, and there's a rebellion in, in the end. So we can maybe talk about that afterwards, the taking the vote thing. But so those, those, the Bible really doesn't say why God does that. Uh, this is a conjecture that th these would be reasons that we would look at and maybe think this is why he allows this to happen once again. I still think it's a bad idea. Uh, last thing is Satan will be cast into the lake of fire where he joins the beast and the false prophet. And notice they've been there for a thousand years, and guess what? They're still there, uh, ending this idea that 
hell will somehow just be what some call annihilation, that uh, people are judged, they're cast into hell, they're tortured for a period of time, and then they cease to exist. Uh, teaching of the Jehovah Witness, Witnesses and, uh, and, and some well-meaning uh, Christians, but we just don't find it consistent in Scripture, uh, unfortunately. I love the doctrine, I just don't find it in the Bible. Uh, I, I wish that that were the case, that people just didn't go on forever and ever. But uh, uh, very interesting that, that God is so pro-life that he doesn't even end life in terms of, uh, of punishment. Uh, and these, these will continue uh, on and on and on. The, uh, I, wanted to, I, mentioned, uh, I wanted to read in closing a passage from Isaiah, another one, chapter 25, verse 6 to 10. And, and what I've done is I've, um, I'm going to read it don't normally do this out of the New Living Translation. I just wanted to kind of put it in everyday language because it's, uh, it's speaking about uh, uh, Jerusalem and Jesus coming, establishing his kingdom. And, um, and, there's, and, and we're going to do a little responsive reading here. I'm going to read verses 6 to 8. We get to verse 9. I'll have it for you on the screen. Then there's a part where, in that day, the people will proclaim... So we're not in that day yet, but we're looking forward to it. So uh, we're going to all proclaim uh, when we get to verse 9. Uh, everybody okay with that? If you're kind of a shy, just mouth it, you know, so people think you're, you're participating. Those of you that are a little more enthusiastic, you can be a little louder to make up for them. In Jerusalem, the Lord of heaven's armies will spread a wonderful feast for all the people of the world. This is what it's going to be like in, in the millennial kingdom. It will be a delicious banquet with clear, well-aged wine and choice meat. There he will remove a cloud of gloom, the shadow of death that hangs over the earth. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. He will remove forever all insults and mockery against his land and people the Lord has spoken. Don't jump in yet. <laughs> and, and these are the days that we are living in where uh, it, it, there is a gloom, you know, that comes over this earth because of sin. And it affects our emotional state. People suffer with depression and, and, and a lot of things. Went to a, a very good um, financial seminar yesterday morning over at uh, Calvary uh, Honolulu. And uh, the guy that was doing the speaking there, Kelly uh, Dunnigan was just talking about the fact he finds it interesting that uh, in, uh, in his business practice in Southern California, although he's got clients all over the country, is that Christians seem to be the most fearful people, which doesn't make sense to him at all. But in terms of finances and concern about the future, the Christians seem to be more fearful than the non-Christians. And of course, his explanation of that is the fact that uh, there is a spiritual warfare going on. And, and one of the ways that Satan wants to attack us is, is financially. And cause us to be afraid instead of trusting in the Lord. And of course, he went through a, a series of scriptures, including the, and I will never leave you and forsake you, which is talking about financially and caring for us and, uh, and so forth. Uh, but there's a gloom that's over this earth. And there's a constant, we live in the day when there's a constant insult and mockery against Israel, the land, and the people, the Jewish people. I um, got to read a little portion of the uh, message that Prime Minister Netanyahu gave a few weeks ago in Poland uh, at, uh, at Auschwitz uh, on the memorial of the Holocaust, and, uh, which is a uh, very large and important celebration for the uh, Jewish people for the nation of Israel. And as the guest speaker, he alluded to, though he didn't say the word, Amadina John, uh, he didn't say the word Iran, but he said many times that as long as he is the leader of the state of Israel, he would never allow another Holocaust to come, though it's being threatened daily uh, by, by their enemies and so forth. Uh, they live in that day, and that day will not exist during the millennial kingdom. In terms of the insults and, and mockery, let me give you one, one example. Uh, right after the, the earthquake in Haiti just a few weeks ago, one of the very first teams on the ground was from Israel. They are ready. Uh, with disaster relief, they have experts in search and rescue. And the minute something like that happens anywhere in the world, they're in the air and they're on there. Within about two days, they had a, a, a hospital opened on the ground in a tent city treating 500 people a day. You probably heard all about that, of course, on CNN. No, actually, you don't, right? 
Uh, but you might have heard this comment, or maybe not. There was a, not an elected official, but an appointed official in Britain, because they were aware that this was, uh, was going on. Uh, and she made the statement that, yeah, Israel did that, but the reason they do that, they go there and they were harvesting organs, and that's what they were doing there. <laughs> this is an appointed official, not in Saudi Arabia. This is in Great Britain. Fortunately, she was fired. Apparently, the second time she was fired for making outlandish anti-Semitic statements, that's the tip of the iceberg of what we hear about. That's not what is said uh, in Islamic countries on, on a regular basis. And that will not go on <laughs> in the millennial kingdom. Uh, the sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. He will remove forever all insults and mockery against his land uh, and people the Lord has spoken. Okay, here we go. Verse 9, have we got it? Here we go. Are you ready? One, two, three. In that day, the people will proclaim, this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord in whom we trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings. For the Lord's hand of blessing will rest on Jerusalem. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you that we can proclaim that that we waited, that we trusted, and you saved us. Lord, there'll be lots of that kind of proclamation going on in the kingdom here on earth. Lord, may it be so in our hearts each and every day as we look forward to that time. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In these desperate times, in these dark and Days. Though we try and try and try, we all will fall in some way. We are struggling toward the light, we are all running toward your voice. Striving for the prize, come to your throne.
We are struggling toward the light. We are all running toward your voice. Striving for the prize. Come to your throne where you reign. Voices of glory. Holy, 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 holy Lord God Almighty. Save it to the soul. stand together. Yeah. 